Thank you. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about my postdoctoral project. Um, uh, it's very early in the project. I started in September, so it's, it's early days. So this is really talk about what I'm going to be doing and what I'm planning and getting started on doing at the moment. Um, and there's not really many results yet, so it's um, really um, my thought processes and methodologies of what, of what I'm going to be doing, which I thought might be useful for any students who are um, currently starting third year projects or final year projects and, and, get, and getting those set up. So, um, so it's about the decisions I'm making and um, the thoughts that, I'm, that are going into that. Um, but also I thought it might be useful to get some feedback by, from people on what uh, I'm doing wrong and what I can do better. So I'm going to cover these, basically these three things. So firstly, why I'm doing it. Um, so what's, why is there still a debate about what happened in Britain um, 1,600 years ago? Um, what I'm going to be doing, uh, so essentially why personal names can be useful in telling us about history and language uh, and identity before and after the fall of Rome, uh, and how I'll use uh, names in my project um, to find out what happened. So... So I'm not sure how many of you, I'll start with why, I'm not sure how many of you will be familiar with the early medieval history of Britain, so I thought I'd start by summarising some of the, uh, the key debates around what happened to Europe, uh, and more specifically Britain, after the fall of Rome, which is what my project aims to shed light on. So following the fall of Rome in the 5th century, um, a number of new ethnic groups developed across the lands that had previously been subject to Roman rule. Um, because of this, um, the early Middle Ages have often been seen, rightly or wrongly, as the period where political and national identities uh, of modern European nations were formed. Now, obviously there's uh, quite a lot of problems with this. Firstly, Rome, as you can see from the map, was both more and less than Europe, um, large parts of it. Uh, parts of Europe sat outside, Rome's frontiers, Ireland for one, but Scandinavia, uh, large parts of Germany, all the Baltic nations, etc. Um, and equally, there was large parts of Rome that sat outside what is now Europe, North Africa, Turkey, and the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and obviously, the political units and identities um, that see their roots as stemming from the early Middle Ages um, can only very loosely be linked to, be linked to this period. Um, and uh, aside from labels... Um, all of those groups in practice have almost nothing in common with uh, their descendants today. So, in reality, a lot of these ideas have foundations in 19th and 20th century uh, nationalist and colonialist, colonialist ideologies which have traced their national histories back to the events of the, the early Middle Ages um, and were often used to explain uh, racial superiority of particular ethnic groups, um, races and colonial regimes. Um, in more recent years we've seen uh, a rise of far-right groups uh, in several European nations as well as places colonised by Europeans who use medieval imagery as symbols of white supremacy um, and even in less sort of intentionally malign ways just tracing um, the roots of ethnicities and national identities back to a single point of origin in this period uh, makes it easy to exclude people who have arrived in the nation after it. So um, Although questions about early medieval migration might not seem important to many people today, um, the use and misuse of history in this period um, mean that uh, they're perhaps a bit more relevant than you might think. So the truth about what, what actually happened during this period is both complex and still hotly debated. Um, within a British context, uh, a large part of this debate revolves around how and why uh, and when uh, a large part of the former Roman province of Britannia um, which was populated by three, three million or so Romano British people, came by about the 7th century uh, to be populated by people who saw themselves as neither Roman nor British, um, but, as have, but as belonging to a number of new ethnic groups who spoke Old English. And there are multiple possible explanations for what caused this change to identities, um, uh, and they can be roughly grouped into these three types. Um, so, so, so to why people changed from being Roman to English. The first one is they didn't. Um, uh, the original native population in this, this first group of ideas was killed um, or forced to flee by invaders and replaced by a large wave of migrants from across the North Sea from places like Denmark and northern Germany. Um, secondly, they were invisible, so they, were, uh, they stayed where they were, but they were so thoroughly subjugated and marginalised um, by the new invaders um, that there's no evidence for them. They, they're so invisible uh, that they just become assimilated into the new culture without leaving any trace. And thirdly, um, they uh, assimilated um, and changed to fit in with a small number of sort of elite Germanic migrants who, uh, who, who ruled over them, and they gradually adopted those uh, those. Um, uh, their norms and values and language and culture, but in a quite a peaceful man manner. Um, this map is from sort of the, 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 the book, um, the textbook in my primary school that made me 
to essentially fall in love with medieval history. And it's incredibly out of date, but actually shows quite well the process that I'm talking about. Um, uh, and as you see, the Britons don't actually appear anywhere on the map because no one actually knows what happened to them. Um, there we go. So one of the reasons why the debate around what happened uh, to the Britons is still ongoing is the seemingly intractable uh, disciplinary divide between historians, archaeologists, and linguists. Um, and it's really quite important in this period because um, the written narrative evidence we have for what took place is slim and mainly written long after the events. Um, so we're really reliant on archaeological and linguistic evidence. Um, so things like uh, the history we've got is usually things like narrative sources, from, uh, mainly from two people called Bede and Gildas. Um, but archaeological remains like burials, material culture, um, sort of the things people used um, in their day-to-day -day lives, settlement patterns, architecture, that sort of thing, um, uh, is the archaeological evidence. Uh, and for linguistics, things like um, mapping changes to language um, uh, over time, language shift from one language to another through language contact, and place name evidence, so, so the names used in different... Uh, the, the, the languages used to coin place names, uh, the evidence we've got. Um, So the main narrative sources we have that could anyway be considered primary are from, from Bede and Gildas, as I've said. Um, Gildas was a Romano British cleric lying in mid-6th century um, from a British perspective, um, and Bede was a Northumbrian monk writing in about 730 from an English perspective. Morgan is probably going to be quite angry with me just describing Bede as a Northumbrian monk, but essentially that's what he was. Um, both of these accounts present uh, a picture of invasion, violence, uh, and large-scale migration and population replacement. Um, so Bede says... Um, the alien peoples vied together to crowd the islands uh, uh, who had invited them to begin to live uh, in terror. Um, and a number of wretched survivors were caught in the mountains and butchered wholesale, says Gildas. Um, they surrendered to the enemy, um, caused to be slaves uh, or, or killed straight away. Others fled the lands beyond the sea. Uh, and for a long time, this was the historical consensus. And all that actually seemed to be backed up by archaeological, uh, archaeological evidence initially. Um, the distribution of different types of material culture suggested that distinct ethnic groups had migrated across the north from the North Sea and settled uh, in clearly defined areas, bringing sort of specific styles of material culture with them. Um, but since the 1970s, archaeologists have revised lots of these ideas for a number of reasons. Firstly, there was no actual evidence of any violence um, that we can see in the archaeological evidence, or very little. Um, it's unlikely that the number of people required to completely replace the population um, on the scale required could have taken place with the kind and types of boats in use at the time. Uh, and thirdly, the mapping of material culture um, to different ethnic groups from across the continent was actually done sort of back to front. They mapped where different, different ethnic groups existed in, in England and Britain at the time, um, sort of set, said these are the things that we found in these groups and then mapped them back to the origin stories from across the sea, so essentially mapping them to the narrative sources, which is back to front. Um, so what they came up with instead was a consensus based around a theory of elite dominance, so one where a small but powerful German elite installed themselves and ruled over the native population. Um, and over a number of generations, they gradually acculturated and abandoned their previous language and culture and became English. Um, so they're still... To a large degree, I think, quite a lot of consensus amongst historians and archaeologists on this, um, although there's sort of a sliding scale of, of the degree uh, of, of, of adherence, so from sort of hardly any newcomers to quite a lot of newcomers. Um, but generally, they would all agree that the idea that native Britons were uh, exterminated and forced to flee um, is wrong, and many of them remained in place, and it's through this ongoing contact with, with new people from across Froth to Sea they changed their culture uh, and ethnic identity. So that's great and really convincing, but the problem is the linguistic evidence says basically the exact opposite. Um, in just about every other situation we know of where similar shifts in culture and language, or just even language on its own from one language to another, um, we can nearly always see the impact of the old language on the new one. So lexical borrowing, so new words being incorporated into the language, um, grammatical structures changing um, to, ref uh, to reflect either long, -going, uh, long, long ongoing contact between the two languages um, or um, a load of sort of adult speakers learning the new language very, very quickly. Um, these, these processes cause languages to change a lot. Um, but the British language, Britonic, seems to have left um, very little impact on English at all in either of these ways. And combined with the place name evidence, um, which shows that most settlements, um, particularly in the south and east of England, um, were, were given names coined in Old English, that's 
including old settlements were renamed and new settlements were named in Old English. So it suggests there was actually a complete takeover of most of the east and south of Britain by Germanic-speaking migrants. So we're basically back where we started with Beed and Gilda, which is why this slide is sort of a circle or more like death spiral of people arguing round and round in circles forever and ever. So one more complicating factor um, is recent research by Peter Shriver, who suggests that rather than speaking a form of late Britonic or late British, um, most of the people in the south and east of Britain would have actually spoken a form of Latin instead, um, like they did in France and places like that. Um, and he says, actually, there's a big explosion of changes in Wales and Cornwall and the language they spoke there, the, that form of Britonic, from around the 5th century, which can only be explained by a large number of people speaking Latin moving westwards. Um, so essentially, the people in the east spoke Latin and moved west, and that changed the, 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 the language that British people spoke. Um, so that, again, supports the... Um, Britain's fled westwards, lots of migrants there. So what am I going to do about it? Um, so as you can see, there are lots of unanswered questions and some would say unanswerable questions surrounding the topic. And to be honest, I sort of wanted to give up just doing this paper because it's it seems like it's an impossible task. But um, I, uh, well, I, I think names are, um, and personal names, so people, names born by people are a potentially useful and relatively unexplored source for re-examining some of the questions uh, in the debate, and particularly uh, envisioning the gap between um, archaeological and linguistic approaches to them. Uh, because personal names sit somewhere between archaeological and linguistic evidence, or perhaps not accurately, accurately they fit, uh, they are both at the same time. So they are, of course, linguistic items. They're usually formed using words from everyday vocabulary, or at least originally, um, so they're, they're words that belong to the language. Um, and they work just like words in, in many ways in terms of their morphology, so the way they're formed and react to different um, sentence positions, uh, and grammatically as well. Importantly, they respond to changes in phonetics and phonology, so the sounds within the words change um, and spelling in the same way um, as other linguistic items, particularly when uh, in contact with other languages. So language contact allows us to see when one language is impacted by another, and we can see that through names. Um, uh, and importantly, you can also um, use names to quite accurately date um, uh, date when someone has been alive. So the, the particular sounds um, that are used in a language at that time will be reflected in the names, and you can pinpoint, pinpoint when that person was alive. Um, and they also, in a sociolinguistic sense, belong to linguistic communities. Um, they are part of the language and the community of speakers that use that particular language. But there are also items of what I've called here immaterial culture um, or non-material culture. Um, so they're not the physical things studied by archaeologists like pots and clothes and jewellery, etc. Um, but they're similar in a lot of ways. So we often talk of um, bearing or carrying a name depending on the language that we speak, um, like it's a physical object um, rather than just a word. Um, they respond to fashion and tastes, uh, and they can be used to demonstrate belonging. Um, unfashionable names can be discarded with the passing of a generation or even during a lifetime, so new names can be adopted or bestowed on someone already living. Um, um, so just like material culture, uh, and certainly much more uh, easily than learning a whole new language. So if I wanted to call myself Etienne and pretend I was French, or I would at least have a French name, um, it would take me a lot longer to actually learn the French language. Um, importantly, while the connection between material culture and specific cultural and ethnic groups is a rather exact science, inexact science, sorry, personal names have a much stronger uh, and well-established connection to group identity. They can and do very often indicate a connection between the bearer of a certain linguistic, uh, with a certain linguistic, cultural, and religious, and for want of a better word, ethnic groups. And the connection is never 100% clear cut. It might not always be intentional, um, and they can change and be forgotten over time. But the appearance of names from a certain linguistic and cultural origin in a specific place can be taken as quite a good indicator that some of those people were part of that particular cultural and linguistic group, um, or at least they've been influenced by people from that cultural and linguistic group in some way. So finally, my project. Um, so my project aims are to use personal names as a means of understanding more about what happened to the people of Britain in the centuries either side of the fall of Rome. So um, I'm gonna, these are the questions I'm going to try and answer. So what was the linguistic map of southern Britain before the fall of Rome? 
so trying to find out the degree of Romanization, Romanization in southern Britain, looking for Latin names and Brit Britonic names and seeing where they were positioned and seeing if you can tell what languages they spoke in that way. Um, where did names of non-English origin persist and for how long? So it's often it's usually assumed that um, people who were, were British descent or British identity disappeared, so we're trying to find out exactly where and how long they persisted and whereabouts in England they were, um, and thinking about how names reflect migration or shifts in ethnic and linguistic identities. So were people forced out and replaced, or did they stay in the same place and adopt new names? Uh, and then finally, what kind of people were born on English names? So thinking about the, their social status and particular religious, religious groups, um, and whether men or women were more likely to bear non-English names. And now, how? Um, so essentially what I'm going to try and do is, or I, I took that out, I did say, what will I, how will I try to do it? But I try to be a bit more confident. So I'm going to analyze and map the names of the people of southern Britain between around 300 and 800. I've already changed the start date to 300 because um, it wasn't long enough at four, 450 years. I decided to make it a clean, a clean 500. But I think actually moving further before the fall of Rome uh, is important to get uh, a view of that um, pre pre pre-Roman, pre-fall of Rome um, period. Um, so I'm going to do that by creating a database of names and then carrying out quantitative and qualitative analysis. So, so geogra geograf geographical GIS mapping to identify um, when and where these names were used and the changes over time uh, as well as between regions. Um, and then qualitative analysis, so detailed studies of individual name forms, so the names themselves and how they were formed and how they um, develop, as well as um, what are called prosopographical studies, so essentially biographical studies of individual people. Um, so looking at the reason, all the information about a person that we know and trying to work out why they might have borne a particular name, essentially. Uh, so, the database. Um, so the heart of this is, what is, is the database, which is uh, currently in the process of, of the design phase. So it's very much a work in progress. I'm trying to work out um, what information or attributes or variables, or whatever you want to call them, I need to include, how to organize the database, and how and where information needs to link together. Um, and it's become clear quite quickly that I'm actually doing two things, because the project is essentially part history and part linguistics. So linguists tend to study names, um, um, so the output of the research is usually a list of names with some analysis about the names, so the origin, etymology, forms, etc. Um, and there might be some information about uh, and citations about where the name's found um, and maybe the person who bore it, but often it's, often it's inter incidental and it's never complete. So it's never a full list of all the people with that name, it's just enough people to make sure that the etymology of the name is, is correct. Um, historians tend to study people, so the output of their research is usually a list of people with information of who they are, what they did, and where they lived, that sort of thing. Um, so while the names are recorded, they're not done in a way that allows any sort of grouping or comparison by individual names. So this isn't my database on the right here. This is um, something called PACE, so the Prosopography of Anglo-Saxon England. So it's a collection of all the people that are known uh, in England, theoretically, between um, sort of the fall of Rome and uh, the 11th century. Um, it's not complete, but there's, there's a lot of names in there. But as you can see, the, the only way of getting to individual names or individual people, uh, or individual names, is to click on the... Uh, the letter it begins with, so you need to know what letters you're looking for, and then all the individual pe different names are listed. And as you can see, there's lots of different variations of the names that are not grouped together, so it makes it a very, very long and uh, laborious process of finding any uh, information if you want to look at names. Uh, and obviously, further down the list, you can see that someone's quite helpfully um, thought um, put um, place names down as personal names, so um, most of those, those, those places at the bottom are just places in France rather than actual people. But anyway, so that I don't want to do, I can't do one or the other, I've got to do both. Um, so I was naturally more interested, I'm a historian, so I naturally thought that the best way would be to create data of so people and then include information about names. But the database needs to show uh, and allow me or anyone else who uses the data to be able to find out about individual names and individual people. Um, and this is especially the case because a lot of the non-English names that I'm focusing on are the ones that would be the most difficult to identify and categorise. So it's a complex research task in its own right. I need to back up all the stuff that I'm uh, saying about the names and uh, recording all the linguistic information and citations about um, where I found it against individual against people would be a too much information uh, and it would create lots of repeat information, because every time a name appears and a person's name appears, I'd have to do it every time. Um, so. 
So what I really need to do is create two or at least two data sets, um, one of names and one of people that are linked together to allow me to interrogate the data from both those perspectives. Uh, and this is essentially a relational database. Um, at the moment, it's actually just two spreadsheets. But I'm collecting the data in a way that should ultimately allow it to be converted into a relational database that has um, one set of combined information, but coming from two different areas of two different parts that are linked together. So the, this is a snapshot of my my Excel spreadsheet, which doesn't actually go down much further than this, but it looks like, but it shows the sort of the breadth of information that I'm collecting on um, the first data set, which is names. So it includes things like a name ID, so that's sort of a numerical uh, um, indicator or identifier for each individual, each specific name. Um, the head form uh, of the ne of, or standard name, so a standardized form, a lemmatized form of the name that lets me group all sort of variations under one under one form, um, things like, uh, or the alternative forms as well, so um, how that name, different name appears in different, uh, in different sources uh, and, and different people. Um, look at the linguistic origin, which is a key one for me, um, things like the morphology, how it's formed, uh, etymology, the different component elements that are going to, to forming it, the linguistic influences, so for example, um, some of these names have Britonic elements in them, but are also influenced by English or Latin, so trying to, trying to record that as well. Um, the gender of the name, um, notes on why I've come to that conclusion that it is a, from a specific origin and sort of citations from other people who looked at them. Um, and then also I'm including so what I've called the, sort of the level of certainty because some of the names will be certainly of that origin, so I'll be certain about them. Some will be less certain, so it's important for me and for other people who look at them to say that, to see whether so the names are sort of definitely from one particular linguistic origin or another. So the second data set is the people. Um, and this will include, again, a numerical identifier, just so, it, so each individual record is, uh, is clear and clearly defined. Um, the recorded name, the variations of that name, uh, the date that they lived, which is important, so sort of a date range, but also a standardized date that I can use when I'm doing, uh, doing, uh, doing mapping and that sort of thing. Um, the location or locations that the person is, is from, or at least associated with, that we know about, um, so a primary location and other locations. Um, relationships that that person has with other people within the database, but also perhaps without, outside the database, um, uh, and uh, notes and that sort of thing. Um, I'm also going to try and include links to other data sources that they, they are in, so that, for example, a lot of these names are included in PACE, so trying to include links to that so that we can, there's more, I don't need to include all the information, I can easily link out to it, but so can other people if and when they ever look at the database. Um, Importantly, for me, I'm including something called a foreign key, so that's a, um, uh, a line in the database, or an item in the database, that links this data set to the previous data set. So, that will, so by including the name ID, instead of having to include all the name information, I just know that um, person, that person 2 um, has the name ID 2 that happens to be the same number, but I can then cross-reference, so essentially cross-reference the names against the people without having to repeat all the information. And as I say, it's still a work in progress. There's a lot of the choice of the variables and the, and the structure of the database needs to be fit for purpose for my project, but also to ensure that other people um, can use it in, uh, in its useful to them uh, in the future for whatever purpose. So they, I not, just because I'm going to use it in, the, in this particular way, I shouldn't assume that other people will use it for the same reason. Um, and there's always a balance to strike between including enough information and too much information, uh, and then creating something that's unwieldy and full of, full of information that adds work without any real benefit. So that's why I'm still working out, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Um, in the future, I might need to include additional data sets. For example, um, I'm just recording given names at the moment because most people only had given names at this period, but at some point I might start having to collect surnames and they won't necessarily fit into that names data set. That'll be a separate data set that I'll have to link into the people as well because they are formed in different ways and have different characteristics, so they wouldn't fit into either. So that would essentially have to create a... Uh, so I'd have to add the surnames into the people, but then link out to a separate data, a data set to, to get that uh, information in. Briefly, I'm going to talk briefly about the sources. So uh, the, the primary sources that I'm getting the names from are things like narrative sources, um, so things like Beeding Gildas, Adels and Chronicles, so more historical records 
uh, uh, that include people's names, sort of functional documents like charters, inscriptions like on the stones that you see in the corridors in the, in the, the fancy building um, with the quad. Um, so inscriptions of people. That's the one. Um, the stone corridor. Yeah, so that type of thing. Um, coins, because they include name information quite a lot, and also possibly, potentially, uh, at some point, place names. So names that are uh, sort of personal names that are present in place names, and particularly things called boundary clauses, which are quite common in, in, in early England, that, in, that, that are sort of descriptions of who owned what land, and they quite often include information on X person, X person, X person, who owned the land around them. Um, but I'm not going to start with those primary sources because that, would take, that would, wouldn't would would be possible, it would take forever. Um, so I'm actually going to use this as my starting point and a series of or a number of other databases um, and printed, printed sources and corpora that, that have already collected people or information on people or names uh, in various forms. Um, I won't go through them all. Things like PACE, um, you don't need to know about these really. Um, but um, the main point is that they're not... None of these are perfect, and they don't include all the names that I need, and they all include lots of names that I don't need, so it's still going to be a long, laborious task of going through, picking them all out, um, uh, uh, and, and doing what I need to do with them. Um, but uh, by doing it f from the databases first, it makes it a much quicker data collection task than if I was going through the primary sources. I will have to go back to the primary sources for a number of them to check them and look at them in more detail, but by starting with the databases, I get a head start. Um, so one thing I also want to be able to do in the database is narrow the search within it um, to the type of source because um, this is something um, that might impact how and when names are recorded because narrative sources might record different types of names and different people to annals and charters and chronicles and inscriptions so um, it might be useful for me or, or to to compare those two. So if there's more British names in charters than in narrative sources, that might mean something um, uh, significant. Uh, it also means that anyone who uses the database in the future, if they're doing a project just on inscriptions, they can find the inscriptions without having to s just source, like to look through every individual one. Um, I'm still, again, still working on how to do it, but that's one, that's one of the aims. Um, and may, one of the main aims is to make sure the database is useful for other people in the future, not just me. So the initial scope of my project at Cork is to focus on the non-English names, so Britonic, Latin and Irish names mainly, um, uh, and focusing initially on England and the south, east, and moving gradually, uh, and also southern Scotland, but also then moving further west into Wales and Cornwall. Um, uh, and that's, the, uh, that's the, main, the main pattern, and I'm going to be looking at that period, 300 to 800. Um, I haven't promised to the Research Council that I will include English names in the database, just to make the scope manageable, but I think I will need to make a start on this because obviously knowing where people with non-English names were present in the period is important, and as well as where they were, is all, um, and, and that, that, that is important, but without knowing how many names they were in relation to English names, um, I can't see any, any, sort of, um, uh, any sort of relative frequency in proportion. Um, so my plan is to, to create, uh, to gather all the names from four particular regions um, in different parts of England to see the differences in distribution in those places and do a, do a sort of um, a four-way comparison of, of those case studies. So one of the most important things about the database is that it needs to be scalable, um, um, which, as I've already said, so I'm, I'm still working out exactly what names are from where and what periods I'm going to include them, and it needs to be able to, 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 to take in more information as, as my, my work expands, but also potentially in future projects. So it might need to include names from a wider geographical area, sort of, so perhaps the rest, rest, of, rest of Britain, Ireland or Brittany, to see migration between those three places. Um, longer chronological periods, different source bases, that sort of thing, um, also different types of names from different linguistic origins. Um, and also the names of unknown origin, um, which I'm not including in my database initially because um, um, that would be a lot of work. But they're, also, they're obviously going to be names that I don't know the etymology of and no one does know the etymology of, but they're just stuck in dusty books somewhere that no one can find. So if at some point I can include all those in the database, um, having them there would allow other people to go and look at them and perhaps find out, use them to, to, find, to, 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 to etymologize them and work out where they're from. So the results from the, data, from the database and the, the quantitative studies should hopefully enable me to show 
the geographical spread of names of diff different origins across southern Britain, as well as how those patterns changed over time um, and how this um, can inform uh, our thinking about migration and that sort of thing. Um, but it also allowed me to carry out further qualitative or micro studies um, of individual names and people. Um, so these will find out. These will involve finding out as much as possible about individuals, um, their lives, their families, their relationships, and how these might have influenced the names that were chosen for them. Um, so the database will also help me find uh, find micro studies that are the most relevant and focus on the best ones rather than just looking at some narrative sources and picking some use, interesting names. Um, I'll have all the names to choose from uh, and I'll be able to focus my, my micro studies um, more effectively. Uh, and here's a very small number of examples. Um, I'm nearly finished, don't worry. Um, okay, firstly, so Serdic is the king of Wessex um, in the 6th century. Um, so uh, the first king of Wessex. Uh, um, so that's roughly the Wiltshire, Hampshire area, which people think where, where he's probably originated from or was at least active in. And his name um, comes from Karotikos, um, um, which is Old British, um, which develops into Keratic um, in Late British and, uh, and Keratic in Welsh uh, and Serdic. Um, so it's definitely a name of Britonic origin. Um, and so he's the founder of not just the West Saxon world dynasty, but the, the English world dynasty. This is, is the sort of Grandfather, great great grandfather, King Alfred, um, Edward the Confessor, that sort of thing. Um, so um, it's likely that he was either of British origin or, or, or at least had some um, uh, element of British identity at this point in the sixth century. Um, in the bottom right, Cadwalla, or Chadwalla, um, was another king of Wessex uh, in the seventh century, so in roughly the same place. Um, his name was from Catawellonos, um, um, which in Welsh gives Cadwallon, um, but this sort of slightly anglicised version. Cadwalla or Chadwalla um, um, it was his name. Interestingly, his father was called Kenbert, so his father had an English name, um, but he was given a, a British name. So, um, so it's, it's another king of England or king, an English king in this period that has a British name, so it might be that there's still some uh, British element within the West Saxon ruling elite at this point, or at least the name um, itself had been incorporated into the name stock through contact with British-speaking people. Um, top right is Chad, or Chadda uh, of Mercia, um, or of the Mer yeah, and he was Bishop of the Northumbrians, the Mercians, and the people of Lindsay in the 7th century. Um, he's also a saint, uh, and he was born in Northumbria. His name, interestingly, is formed, is formed of the same first element as Cadwalla's name, Katu, um, which is a British element. Um, but the suffix, the A, um, which gives Chadda um, the, sort of the, the full version of his name, um, uh, is, is an English hypercharistic suffix. So essentially, um, putting A on the name is like um, shortening the name Jonathan to John to Johnny. So that the A is the, is the E sound in, the, in this sense. Um, so the fact that it's formed with an, uh, an Old English suffix suggests that it was shortened by Old English speakers, um, which is interesting and suggests so, so an element of hybridity. Um, he also had three brothers called Ched, Coonbill and Kaelin. At least two of these, and possibly all three, um, are suspiciously Britonic in, uh, in formation too. So again, suggesting there's still some British elements in, in the, the West Saxon ruling elite at this point. And finally, um, the St. Patrick, um, for, who was uh, around in the 5th century, we think. Um, he was born in Cumbria, uh, in north northwest England, um, and so he's got a Latin name. His father, Calpurnius, also had a Latin name and has uh, had a prominent role in sort of the late British society. But uh, it's clear that Patrick saw himself as both a Briton and a Roman in the post-Roman period. Interestingly, in one of his letters, um, he admonishes his fellow countrymen, um, a, a northern British leader, for behaving more like a barbarian than a Roman. Uh, and that hit king happened to be called um, Kuroticos, um, the same uh, name as Keratic, where uh, Keratic, the king of Brit the king of England, or the king of Wessex in the sixth century. Um, so there's obviously, I think, more to be to be said about the way these names were used in different different places and different times, and, and the lessons we can draw from them. Very much finally, um, this final map. This is sort of an idea of what I'm going to be trying to do with with mapping, trying to work out where certain names were at certain periods and, and how these, these develop over time. So this is a group of names, um, all beginning with a Britonic element, um, tud, which meant people and tribe. Um, most of them are combined with old English suffixes again, so these are the sort of shortened elements at the end of a name. So we've already seen the A, so tudda, but also tudi, um, tudla, tudel, or all, all so, and tudlin, we think, are protected that's less sure, um, but they're all, almost all certainly formed with this old British element. Um, the records we have for them are 
between the 6th and 9th centuries. The, er the earliest is actually the very early 7th century, and the latest, Tudor, is actually goes into the 9th century. He lives uh, 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 into, the, into the 9th century. So, they're, A, they're quite late, and they're also a lot of them in, in Eastern Old English-speaking areas. So the evidence seems... Uh, seems to say these names in existence or in, in places that we wouldn't expect to find them at that particular period. Um, so it, it, it suggests that there might have been some hybridity of names, at least in the early period of contact between British natives uh, and Germanic incomers. Um, even if at the time they're being used at this point they've, they've become English uh, uh, or entered the English name stock, it shows evidence of, of this contact. And, and obviously these are just a few examples, but hopefully in a couple of years' time uh, my data will show that British names in these areas uh, of early medieval Britain were not totally eclipsed, uh, or at least not as much as previously been thought. That's me done.